it. Amen. I think it's Dennis. It's got to be you, right, Dennis? <laughs> it's got to be. Praise the Lord. Well, we're down a little bit today. I guess you got the triple threat. You got spring break. You got the time change. You got the rain. I just don't want to say anything about those folks that are not here, but you that are here, I want to give you a double pat on the back and say praise the Lord if you, <laughs> for your faithfulness. It doesn't take a little bit to keep you out. Praise the Lord. But we're just going to have church in spite of all that. Amen. And rejoice. This is the first day of the week. This way we start our weeks around here with Jesus. And uh, that's the only way to finish your week. Amen. We had an exceptional time at the other campus this morning. Even our crowd was affected over there a little bit by the, the, the weather as well. But we're in this message series on the journey to the cross. In fact, we are in the message series on Easter. And we talk about the resurrection. But we're going through these stages uh, of those last uh, hours, really, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Last week, we spoke about the Passover in the upper room. So they were gathered there together. We went through everything that happened in the upper room, everything from the, 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 the instructions, the, 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 the Passover meal, the institution of the Lord's Supper, and even the Lord Jesus identifying Judas in the midst of the betrayer and him departing. And then the only thing we really didn't cover about the, the upper room last week was that before they departed, one of the gospels says they sang a hymn. Really, it's a, it's a praise. And it most likely was a Passover praise, a, the Hallel it's called, which would be the, a hallelujah. They literally had a time of worship. Probably most likely those praises and those came out of Psalms, uh, chapters 115 through chapter 118 is what they call the Hallel, the praises of God. And uh, can you imagine just being there in that upper room at that time with the Lord Jesus, first of all, just being one of those disciples in that, that glorious moment. The Lord Jesus had told them, I have longed to have this pass over with you or with, an, with an anticipation or a desire. He tells them he wanted to have that specific one. Obviously, the reasons we now clearly understand why that specific one. But then to close that time, uh, of just uh, that, that sacred, holy moment. I mean, there was a mixed environment in the room, if you look at scriptures carefully. One, the excitement of Passover for the everyday Jewish person. And then two, the excitement of the disciples having Passover with the Lord. And then ultimately, there, there's that other mixed emotion of the heaviness or the, the moment of, of, of being there with the Lord Jesus. But then to end that time with a time of praise, I, I can only imagine just being there as Jesus stands up and begins to, to lead them in worship as he begins to sing out and the disciples join in and, and begin to sing, what a moment that must have been. I, I don't imagine that uh, anybody could stand back and criticize Jesus for being a little pitchy or something, but anyway, because <laughs> there was such, probably such clarity of worship and praise uh, from the Lord Jesus to the Father, and then as he leads the disciples in that time. But then, you know, before they leave, there's, there's a period of time that, the, that he spends conversing with them and, and they go to the garden. So what we're going to cover today, and I probably won't get through all of it, but we're going to try to get through at least two of these three, the preparations, the prayer of Gethsemane, and then the assault and, and the arrest that take place. We'll start with uh, the conversations and the preparations because the preparations dealt with the conversation, final words from the Lord Jesus Christ to his disciples. Now certainly it would be interesting to know... Uh, like the Lord Jesus, what day that we are going to pass, all right? When, when, uh, when our time is finished on this earth, I'm certain if we knew the dates, we knew what hour is going to be, that we would gather those around us whom we love dearly, who we really cared about the most, and would hopefully have something to say to them, instruction, encouragement, uh, edification. Uh, and this is exactly what's taking place. The Lord does know that his hour is coming. In fact, you know, in John 13, where we read last week, the Passover meal was taken and the, the Lord's Supper was instituted that. The Lord in, in, it begins to now to really just relate to these disciples of the things that are getting ready to come, what's getting to ahead. In fact, in fact, he says in 31 and 32 that the Son of Man, you know, it's now the Son of Man glorified and, the, and God is glorified in him. What I want to do with the with these, these final words part of this, is kind of give you a brief synopsis of what the Lord says, and then we'll move from there to what he says on the way to Gethsemane as they're going down from the Mount of Olives, uh, I mean, down from the upper room there on Mount Zion to over to where the, the Gethsemane is. But he's, he's still right now in the upper room, and he's sharing some things with them. The Son of Man's about to be glorified. But he's giving them instruction. And the more I looked at this this week and even the last several weeks as I've been preparing for this particular sermon series, I was just blown away, uh, for lack of better terminology, of just how much the Lord Jesus is reaching out in compassion to these men. 
and you really begin to see just how much he loves them, but hold in that regard also just how much he loves us. You begin to see clearly see just how much he, he cares about me, how much he cares about you, because they represent the church. They represent you know, the, the pillars of the church. The, these 11 men at Judas' departed, remember, are getting some very clear instruction from someone who definitely, deliberately wants him to know what's ahead of them and wants him to know what to do as the crisis begins to unfold before them. And boy, he just clearly begins to lay out for them what's ahead, what they should do, and how much he really loves them. He tells them, you know, the Son of Man is is glorified and God is glorified in him. And it's from this point on that I really want you to see the compassion of the Lord Jesus. In fact, it's not just in chapter 13. I'm going to walk you through chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, all right, as we look at this first part of this message. That's a long sermon. Well, I'll summarize, all right? And so you clearly see what's happening and, and remember, when, this, this, when the, the Gospel of John was written, as well as the others, they didn't come across written as chapter and verse. Those were added, you know, centuries later, just for clarification and for study purpose, so we could find these passages and relate to where, you know, have addresses to look things up with. So understand that this is written as just a, a flowing manuscript. Thank the Lord Jesus. <laughs> We've got, we got somebody on the power and the plugs. And this, is, this is a... This is a flowing manuscript of, uh, in, in the Word of God where he's just, it's a very clear instruction from Jesus of where we're going, what we need to do, what needs to happen next. So as we go through this in John chapter 13, verses 33, 35, he, he tells them very clearly, I, I am leaving and you can't go where I'm going. You have got to love each other so much so that other people will know that you belong to me. All right, here's what I like. One of you come turn off these backside lights, at least on the two sides over here, far sides. That'll, for some reason, we're getting some bleed over or something, but that'll help some of that. So he said, I'm leaving you. you. You don't know where I'm going, but I want you to know I'm going to prepare the way. And he says this to them at this point. One thing that's imperative, and, and you've really got to look at these chapters like a, like, like, like a family, like, like these guys are the closest thing to him on this planet, and he cares so much for them. He said, you got to understand, you know, I'm, go- I'm going, you can't go where I'm going right now, you know. But most importantly, you have got to love each other. In fact, you've got to love each other so much that everybody around you knows just how much, you know, that you love each other. So they'll know who you are and they'll believe in me as a result of that. In other words, he said, your love's got to be profound for each other. You know, capture this in the context of what's happened a couple of days before this when there's this dissension in the group about who's going to be the greatest And so the Lord knows that one of the crying needs for these men at this time and still the crying need of the church today is that we must love each other so much so that people know who we are and where we come from and who we belong to. Of course, that's that point where Peter jumps up and says, well, Lord, uh, you know, uh, I'll go with you wherever you're going. And I don't care what the cost is and I don't care what it costs, whatever, wherever that's me. To which the Lord turns to Peter at that point and responds to him, you know, before morning breaks and the cock crows, you know, you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows. Before that rooster lets out its good morning blurt, you're going to have, you're going to have denied me three times. And there he moves to, to John chapter 14. Again, remember, there's no chapter breaks in the, in the course of what he's saying to them. In John 14, that's that passage you see so many preachers preach funerals out of where it talks about, you know, I'm going to prepare a place for you. But Jesus starts that discourse in, in verses 1 through 5 by saying, you know, I know your hearts are troubled. Don't be troubled. No, don't freak out. And in the course of those few verses, he says this, just believe me, believe what I'm saying to you, trust in what I'm telling you, love one another, but you've got to understand that, hey, I'm going to go prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. I'm going to, get, I'm going to my father's house. There's many rooms. I mean, translation to King James says there's many mansions. It literally translates, there's just one big house, the father's house. And there's many abiding places, many dwelling places within that house. So I'm going to go get it ready so that we can all can be there together. To which the disciples began to chime in. How, how can we know how to get there? How, how do we know the way? And then there's that great, trans, that great verse that Jesus says, I am the way. I am the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No man gets to the Father, the Father's house, but by me. And he gives them clarity. Hey, if you want to get to the Father's house, you continue to follow me. And then he, he chimes in and gives them a little more instruction in regard. If you've seen me, you know you've seen the Father, so I am the way to get to the Father's house. You continue to trust. 
You continue to abide. You continue to follow. You continue to love. And it's, it's just kind of repeated through there. And then he gets into verse 14 where he's talking about the context again. If you have any questions, if you need, if you need instruction, if you need more help, you know, uh, pray. Ask my Father in my name. It's kind of like, if you have a question, call home. Call dad. And literally that's the terminology of Abba. It gets back to dad or daddy. It's an intimate family term, not like father. It really gets much closer and intimacy of, of, of the daddy concept. He said, you know, if there's anything else you need to know, you can ask dad. In fact, call dad, and I'm going to put a little comment vernacular today. Tell him I said call. <laughs> tell him I said, tell him, hey, Jesus said call. And they'll ask in my name. How many times have you used a, a little bit of a name dropping with somebody because you wanted to get something and say, well, you know, so-and-so said to call you, and so-and-so said, and uh, there's a little change in the attitude there where you might get actually something done. This is what the Lord's telling them. You have access to the Father. You're in the family. I, I am your brother. There's a, it's all been paid for. And, but he also said, you can not only ask the Father, I'm also going to send you someone who will be with you. That apparently didn't help too much, did it? He'll be with you. He'll be in you. And he's called, at this point, Jesus calls him the helper. And we know this is the reference to the Holy Spirit who would come on the day of Pentecost and who would not only be with us now, but he now resides in us. So the beauty of this is that not only do I have someone who called aside to help me, I have someone who's there to help me who's there at all times, and he is in me. So John 14, he's continuing with his instructions, and he gets into around verses 21. There's about nine verses there. But he basically wraps it up by saying, you must trust me by doing what I'm telling you to do. You have to trust me. You trust me. You love me. And you, you can prove that you trust me by obeying. And he talks about loving, and he talks about following, and he talks about abiding. And he goes on to say, and by the way, in case you don't remember what I've said, the helper is going to remind you about what I've said. So it gives us this, this great access to everything we'll need through prayer, through the presence of the Holy Spirit, through the word that he's given us, and the Holy Spirit reminds us of the word. In fact, the Holy Spirit so well reminded them that he and caused them to write out for us the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he goes through this. He said, hey, but if you, ever, you, you won't forget, and if you do forget, the Holy Spirit's going to help you remember. So then he says in verse 31 of that chapter, so get up and let us go from here. And then he moves out of that upper room, and as they're making the way, then comes this discourse out of John 15. As he's still comparing to, preparing their hearts, and they're leaving the upper room, and they're on their way to Gethsemane. And as they're going to Gethsemane, the Lord begins to speak to them, and that's where he says, you know, my father is the husbandman, you know, that I am the vine, and you're the branches. Any person that bears me will bear fruit. That's that whole discourse of verses 1 through 11. If you abide in me, you'll have fullness. If you abide in me, you'll have fruit. If you abide in me, your life will have meaning. If you abide in me, there'll be satisfaction. Again, there's no chapter breaks and verses breaks here. It's just the Lord speaking in the flow of what's going on that evening as they're going, where he's just kind of giving them the grace instructions for what lays ahead of them. Abide in me, rest in me. And if you love me, he says again, in that, those verses, then you'll do these things. Isn't it interesting? He's just communicating all this love. And then he's telling them in return, you'll do what you're going to do because you love me. I'm doing what I'm doing because I love you. And then he says, again, he reiterates in chapter 15, verse 12, but you must love each other. You must love each other. And this is a radical love, folks. This is, this is a love that endures. This is a love that keeps up. This is a love that hangs in there. This is a love that tolerates. This is a love that's patient. It's a love that's long-suffering. It's a love that's committed to the end, to each other as the people of God. You've got to love each other. Verse 17, he even repeats again, you must love one another. In fact, he wraps that up in that little section as they're going by saying, hey, the world's not going to understand you. In fact, they'll probably reject you, and they're going to hate you, and they're going to kill some of you. You need to love each other because the world's not going to. And that's why it's so important that we understand the words of the Lord Jesus that he gave to his disciples because they're still the same words today as he speaks to us. And then it moves again without chapter breaks in the course of the evening as they're making their way to Gethsemane. As it moves into John chapter 16, he's still speaking to them. And he says, you know, the, the possibility is that some of you are going to die. They're not going to hate you. Some of you are going to have to die. Verses 5, when he gets into verses through 15, he said, I'm going to go. And I, I have to go because if I don't go, the Holy Spirit, the helper, cannot come. All right? But when he comes, he's going to make everything clear to you. 
It's going to become obvious what this is all about and what you're to do and what I need you to do. He said, but mostly, in, in, you just need to be, be listening and you need to be attentive. And you realize that when he comes, he's not going to talk about himself. He's going to lift me up and he's going to exalt me. He said, but I, I am leaving you and you'll grieve and it's going to be difficult. And you're going to be sorrow. And we know that the, the day after the cross, that, that the evening, and then it carried in the evening, and how much sorrow and how much grief was there. But Jesus told him, hey, I'm going to take that grief, and I'm going to turn that grief into joy, and I'm going to make it full, and I'm going to make it complete. And then in verse 23, he said, but remember to ask the Father. Call home. There's going to be times when you're just not going to be able to deal with this, and you're going to have to talk to Father. You're going to have to talk to Dad. You're going to have to spend some time with God, the Father. There's courses of life that people are not going to be able to walk with you through. There's situations you have to deal with. Others are not going to be able to deal with you with. But God will, and the helper will. And this is what he's saying. But again, these are the same instructions for us today as he relates these things. And then chapter 7, I really don't have time to get into this whole chapter, but it's a beautiful time of really what we would call the Lord's Prayer. A lot of people think the Lord's Prayer is found in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus is talking about, you know, pray in this manner. Well, that's the model prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven. That's a model in which you follow. It's, right. it's not just something to be repeated. There are principles in that passage that God wants you to learn about prayer. But in John 17, it really is the Lord's Prayer. And if you really want to see the love and the compassion of Jesus for humanity, and especially for those disciples, and especially for all those who follow him, you read John chapter 17. And continue to read how much it, that Jesus loves them, has committed them, but again, how much he's been saying to them over and over again, even through the prayer of God, that they would be united, that there would be love, that there would be passion, one for another, and their commitment for one another. And then is there, he's ending that prayer time. And it, whether he's at Gethsemane praying that or on the way, it seems to me that he's in, or getting there in the, in the process of Gethsemane. This is prior that prayer is prayed, but they arrive at Gethsemane. And let me just read you from Matthew 26 in the, as, he's, as, as the prayer time comes and Gethsemane comes of what happens here. And before I read it, I want you to read it and listen to me as I read it in the context of what Gethsemane is and what it's really all about. Many of you know that Gethsemane was, a, was an olive production place. It was, a, it, was a, it was an olive grove, and there, was a, there would be the implementation, there would be the buildings there for, for processing and pressing the olives to get the oil out of them. In fact, if you've ever been to me with one of our trips to Israel, one of the things that we always go to is, is to a place that's known today as Gethsemane. It may not be, it had to be very near where it was. But you'll also see their olive presses. And what they are, these were, these were circular kinds of uh, things hewn out of stone where all the olives would be piled in. And there'd be uh, places where the oil would pour down and come out a hole in the side where there'd be a vat to, a place to collect the oil from the olives. And the way they would get the olive oil out of the olives, they'd take huge stones and they would, you know, there'd be a hole in it and a stick run through it and the stone would go round and round the press and it would press all the oil out of the olives. In fact, on the average, there were three pressings that would take place for the olives. First time you put them in, the first pressing would be what was known as virgin oil. People say, well, what's, what's the difference between olive oil and pure virgin olive oil? Olive oil, 100% virgin olive oil, is the first pressing of the olives. That's the first part. It's the most valuable part. It's the cleanest part. It's the purest part. It was the part that would be used for anointing in worship. It's the part that would be used in the temple for worship. It was the most valuable part. Then that would come after that, that, that oil would be collected. And then the second pressing would be taking place. And that would be used for other things. Maybe for, 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 for medicine, other issues of household things. And then the third pressing which would be used for lamp oil and, and things like that. But there would be these pressings that would take place. If you follow through, you'll see that Jesus is going through basically three pressings himself in the, in the Gethsemane. And as we look at it, I think you hopefully see today just all that the Lord endured in his place. Remember, it is nighttime. They've left the upper room. Jesus is just with the 11 now. Judas has gone to betray him. They approach this place called Gethsemane. As we read it, you'll see the Lord first of all tells them to sit down near the enclosure as they go into this particular area where the pressing is going to happen. And then Jesus takes Peter, John, and James, referred to in what we'll read in a moment as the sons of Zebedee, and he takes them in a little deeper into the garden area because I believe for several things. One, for the friendship, the fellowship, the prayer necessity to pray for him while he endures this. But also to witness, 
these founders, these leaders, these, these apostles of the first church to give witness to what would take place in that garden. All right, so let's start in, in, in chapter 26, verse 36. as It says, Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. And he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep Watch with me. In verse 39. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went away again. A second time, and he prayed and said, My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, you will be done. And he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And then he left them again, and he went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. Now, this garden, the Bible says Jesus was, often would get away to refresh himself, but this time of the garden was not going to be refreshing. This garden reminds me of another garden in the book of Genesis when Adam sinned against God. You remember the Bible says that he and Eve were in the garden and they were hiding themselves because they had sinned against God. And they were, they were filled with shame and they were filled with fear. And God came into that garden and he said to Adam, Adam, where are you? God knew where he was. He wanted Adam to confess where he was. Adam, where are you? Well, here we are. Hundreds of hundreds of years later, we're now at another garden called Gethsemane. And the Lord comes looking now for the second Adam in this garden and says, where are you? But the second Adam doesn't hide for fear. The second Adam doesn't deliberate in trembling. The second Adam responds to the voice of his father and comes forward to spend time and begin to enter into that time of suffering. Some people think the suffering begins when he leaves Gethsemane. No, you see Jesus at Gethsemane suffering profoundly for the sins of mankind, resolutely standing there and exclaiming, I am here to do thy will. And if you look close at Jesus, uh, you don't see him as you saw him in the upper room with, with the same kind of deport or the same kind of carrying himself, I believe. You see completely something absolutely different. Jeremiah spoke of this kind of time in scriptures when he said, you know, his heart is turned within him and all his members quake. There's another prophetic scripture in Psalms 22 where he says, I am a worm and no man. Here you see a broken, crushed individual suffering supremely, extremely, profoundly. And I don't think there's any kind of adjective or adverb that I can add to what he was doing or what he was experiencing or who he was other than those words that, you know, he is completely surrounded and enveloped with heaviness and sorrow and pain. You know, here he comes. He's announced himself as the Redeemer. But when you look at Gethsemane and you see him the way you see him as described throughout the Gospels in Gethsemane, it looks like he needs redemption. You see him here as the bleeding, broken, suffering Savior. I mean, his sublime title in Scripture is the Prince of Peace. But when you look at Gethsemane, boy, there's no one in all of creation that needs peace more than he does even at this moment. And he'd only been there for a little while and only gone a few paces into the garden when the Bible says that when he got in there, he began to be very sorrowful and very heavy. So catch what happens all of a sudden. From giving this great instruction, dealing with disciples, now he's dealing with something completely different and his attention is completely turned to something else. And now he's very sorrowful and he's very heavy. And it's in these words that history kind of gives us a hint that something that's unheard of before now, he has to deal with. Something he hasn't dealt with in his walk as a man that he's now having to deal with. And at the same time, he kind of intimates the distress uh, which seized him was voluntary. He, en he endured it voluntary. He, he just took it upon himself. It says, before their eyes, he became very heavy. Before their eyes, he's very sorrowful. In fact, he, he makes use uh, of a word here where it talks about he, was, he began to be sore amazed, as one of the Gospels says. In other words, he sees something. 
In fact, he makes use of a word from the original language here in the scriptures for this being sudden amaze. It talks about a sudden or a horrifying alarm at a terrible sight or of an object or something that's just horrible to behold. And here's Jesus. He enters this heaven because now he's seeing something they don't see. He knows what he's dealing with, all right? But there's, he's seeing something here that is just horrific. It's horrendous. It's ungodly. It's, it's unholy. It is a terrible moment. And it's here he has, to, he has to deal with it and face it and, and, and realize it as it really is. He not just beholds it. In fact, the whole idea is that he is entering into it. Immediately after he's facing this, this, this horrific sight, after this first attack, he gets up, he goes back to the disciples with the words, and, you know, he kind of casts strong light upon their, the, the state of mind. He says to them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful. Now, he's been praying. He's been viewing what's before him. It's terrible. And now he goes back to them. He says, I, I don't know if I can handle this. I'm about to die it's so bad. This thing is so bad, I'm about to die. This is horrific. It is so hard. And there they are, you know. It, it, in fact, when you look at this, it doesn't just indicate the, the measure, but it's kind of the nature of his suffering. It's not just big. It, the very nature of it is, is, is that which brings death and sorrow and pain. In fact, you read it in another sequel of the Gospels. It says he was in an agony. Another one says he was, translation says, he wrestled with death itself. That's the horror of Gethsemane. I think so many times we, we look at the agonies of the cross and we just bypass Gethsemane and we see the beatings and the brutality of the, of the Romans and then we see the, the, the being shoved around by Herod and, and also by the, by the high priest and then being slapped around and, you know, mocked and ridiculed. But we forget sometimes the agony, the suffering that was going on. It was in the horrors of what he was facing that he, he felt himself not just being placed merely in the way of looking at something. The whole idea here is that there's this mysterious way of entering in to what he has beheld. It looks horrible. It's horrific. It's terrible. And now I have to get into it. In fact, you see just how, how, the, how his distress increases because, you know, he goes back to the, the three that are there and, and he's feeble. I believe he's wrecked physically as he's going through this and looking for some slight of support or consolation. You know, he goes to them and, you know, they're there and they're, you know, they're, they're not maintaining. He says, listen, Terry, watch with me now. What's he saying by that? He's saying, don't leave me. And I think really he's saying your presence is a comfort. You know, they, you know, you think they need to be pitied, but in this position, it's really him who should be pitied. And he says, Terry here. Anyway, you think about it in the context of that. Uh, if you're looking to the disciples who couldn't even stay awake to, <laughs> to be of some kind of benefit to you, I mean, they seem to be, you know, uh, pretty frail. And, but he's saying to them, to those three especially, watch with me. Watch with me. Don't you see where we're entering? Don't you, you understand what, what's happening here? Can't you see where we're walking? Can't, don't you know the atmosphere of everything that's going on? And that's when he goes back to the Lord. And there's that, 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 that quote and that, that verse about, about the cup. You know, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou will. So he's there in the garden saying, God, God, take this away from me. Now, by the way, some ask at this point, how can Jesus inquire at this point whether the redemption of mankind can be removed from him? Don't misunderstand this quote. He's not talking about the cross. He's not talking about redemption being removed from him. He's talking about the horrors of Gethsemane. He's talking about the pressing of Gethsemane. And I'll explain that in just a moment, just how horrible and how wretched that what he's dealing with and how terrible it is. So he rises up from the ground. You know, he's forced, basically says he fell down on his face. You know, you see him going down the ground first and then upon his knees, falling on his face, at this point on his face. Oh God, my father, if there's any way this can depart from me. And all this is happening. And as it's happening, the Bible says he begins to sweat those great drops of blood. And his garments are being stained. And the ground where his brow is in front of him is being stained. And as he's praying, the blood is dropping onto his hands and onto his arms. And he's physically, the, his, his body is going through some horrendous pressing where literally blood is coming up and out of his pores. Lord, if there's any way, let this cup pass from me. 
And again, Jesus gets up and goes back to somehow look to the disciples for some consolation or some kind of, 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 of a prayer. But there's, you know, you find them sunk, it says, in deep sleep. He awakens first Peter and says, couldn't you just, couldn't you, couldn't you, Peter, just watch for one hour? By the way, remember what Peter said just a, a couple of hours before. <laughs> Wherever you're going, I'm going. Whatever you have to face, I'll face. And he's not. Because no one really could go there but Jesus. And no one could really face that but Jesus. He asked them a solemn question to the three of them. Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. And that's that quote where he says, Truly the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Maybe in your spirit you want to, but you just can't do it. And then the Bible says he returns deeper into the shade of the garden and then he begins to pray a second time. And it's literally, it's, an un, it's kind of an altered form of what he's prayed before. Where, Lord, I know it's possible. All things are possible. But he, he let this cup. And then he just prays, oh, Father, if this cup may not pass from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. In fact, one of the passages of scriptures read, when he went in there and prayed about the cup the second time, he prayed more earnestly than he did before. Now, what's meant by this request when he talks about, you know, this, this cup? What's meant by, by asking the Father? If it's not about the, the cross and all that, then what is meant? First of all, you need to understand that when Jesus Christ was on the earth, he's still God. But never once did he act independently of his own merit, of his own strength. In fact, the truth of the matter is Jesus came and taught us how to live by faith. He could have done everything in his own strength should he desire to, but he did not. Remember what he said in John on several occasions throughout the Gospels, I only do what the Father tells me. I only speak what the Father tells me to say. I only do what the Father, I only act in regard to what my Father's telling me. That's the life of faith. That's the life we live. We do what the Father tells us by faith. And then we see God move. And as Jesus moved and operated in obedience to the Father, God did miracles through him. Basically, Jesus didn't do the miracles. The Father did the miracles through him. Could he have done the miracles? Yes, he's God. But he relied every step, every word, every walk, always upon his heavenly Father. You say, I don't know about it. Just read the Gospels, and you'll see it very clear when Jesus says, All this is my Father working, so that he may be glorified in. He's truly, fully God, but understand, he abstained from the exercise of his deity, only is permitted, used them as permitted by the heavenly Father. So understand, Jesus going into Gethsemane, he is the pure, righteous, holy unadulterated, never sinned, holy Lamb of God. Second of all about this, he doesn't pray to be delivered from the impending suffering generally, but just the removal of the horror that he's facing and enduring in that particular moment. And I'll explain why it is so horrific in just a moment. But the third thing about this, he only asked the Father whether the, you know, he only asked him whether, whether without infringing upon the redemptive acts and the redemptive work of the cross that the cup might pass from him. Uh, there's only a conditional possibility. He knew God could do that, but it wasn't in the Father's will. And so he says to the Father, whatever you will, thy will be done. I will drink then the cup to the dredge. I will drink this cup till it's empty. Now, why is it such a horrific moment? Why is he suffering so? Why is it pressing on him so? Understand, number one, in regard to that, his agony was first cause, and there's three causes I want to look at here, on the basis of his suffering at Gethsemane. One was, is that his agony was first caused by the horrific nature of what he's looking at, the horror of sin against God. It's an abomination to him. He has never sinned. The Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin. And when Jesus Christ gets a full look at sin that is coming upon him, the Bible says he's going to become sin for us who knew no sin. As he's seeing that, he is horrified. The abomination, the filth, the wickedness, the defilement, every kind of imaginal perversion, ungodliness that man has ever committed, he is now fully seeing. Remember, the Bible says God doesn't look upon evil. Here's God's son, God himself, now beholding. Now it says it's coming. Remember, it was a horrific sight for him, the object that we talked about that caused him sore amazement. I believe it's the ugliness, the wretchedness, the separation of sin, the, the, the whole idea that, that he is so holy. Uh, he's eternal majesty. He's the almighty holy one. And now he's going to stand in the absolute place of what is opposite of everything he's always known, of sin. The second thing is, he feels himself now and sees himself 
as the offering or the culprit before God to be separated from God. It is though now he has to enter into all that rebellion and all that immorality and all that wickedness that he's been exposed to. Now he has to become the offering and the cursed sacrifice for it. Just like the lamb who would be slain for the sins of the nation, he now becomes the lamb of God that's to be slain, literally becoming the curse. And I do believe that in this moment, he is sensing and knowing and deeply, inwardly, vitally feeling that he is now becoming that cursed defilement. Psalms 22, again, as we said, is a prophetic psalm. It says, Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. My strength is dried up like the potsherd. My tongue cleaves to my jaws, and you have brought me into the dust of death. You're getting a little insight of just the awfulness and how wretched and how horrible sin really is. I think that's what Isaiah was prophesying when he says, you know, he hath borne our griefs. He has carried our sorrows. And in Gethsemane, you see him bearing grief and bearing sorrow even unto death, so much so that God opens the doorway to heaven and sends an angel to minister to him. Had not the angel come to minister to him, I don't know if he'd have gotten out of Gethsemane alive. God, in carrying out his will, sends this angel who ministers to the Lord Jesus Christ. In this process, he's sweating the blood. The third cause of the bitter distresses of the Lord Jesus Christ in Gethsemane, it could be found and sought out in the world of the demonic. Understand that there's more than just physical suffering. Not only is he horrified by sin, horrified by the fact that he's getting ready to become sin, now he has to... Un undergo the, the slot from this moment on, I believe, all the way to the final, it is finished, the, the, the onslaught of the demonic world. And I, I believe with all my heart that, that every demon that could be mustered up in, in, in living on the planet was probably centralized in its attack upon this little tiny place of earth where the Lord Jesus Christ was. And I believe Satan came against him with everything he had in the garden. So much so, you know, that Jesus even intimated itself that the prince of this world cometh. That's what he told his disciples. The prince of this world cometh. He told him in John 16 that when he comes, though, he will not find anything in me. He called it this hour of darkness, this, this power of darkness. I mean, all, those, all that terminology surrounding this particular time showed that Jesus was fighting on a demonic front as well. I believe every temptation was thrown before him. I believe that every assault... I fully believe with all my heart that in that garden, while Jesus was on his knees, bearing our sorrows and our grief, that Satan was railing accusations, well, you think your father loves you? Apparently your father doesn't love you. If your father really loved you, then you wouldn't have to... How many times have we heard those kind of things? <laughs> How many times has Satan condemned us and sought to accuse us? He's called the accuser of the brethren. Don't think for a moment that Jesus didn't endure those accusations in Gethsemane, because I believe he's going through all those things as he has to put up with the, the assailing forces of hell and deal with those kind of things. Boy, in Psalms 18, it's, it's really realized here in a prophetic sense when he talks about the sorrows of death come past me, the floods of ungodly men made me afraid, the sorrows of hell come past me about, the snares of death prevented me. All those things give us a real clear picture in a prophetic sense of exactly what Jesus would endure all in this time of suffering from Gethsemane all the way to the cross. What a Savior. What a Master, what a Lord, and what a King who would do that for you and who would do that for me. The practical side of that, don't miss it, because it's important that the practical side is there's times when you're going to stand in places in your own spiritual life where you're just not certain, should I really do what God wants or should I take this easier route? Should I take this other path? What should you do? Well, those moments are like Gethsemane in some ways for us as well, when it seems that every pressure is upon us to abandon what we know is to be right and truth. Those are the moments we should watch and pray. Those are the moments we should tarry at Gethsemane in the garden, pray through till victory comes. There's other times when we also go through times of great temptation. Some of you may know this in some area of your life. Maybe there's a particular issue that's become like a stronghold in your life. You say, I just don't know how to overcome it. And, and you've memorized some scripture perhaps, but there's a certain element you cannot miss here. Even given to us in the model of prayer by the Lord Jesus when he said, deliver us on this day from temptation. Amen. Deliver us from the evil one. 
Same thing we should pray. If you're in a crisis of morality or a crisis of, of uh, identity in your relationship to Christ or a crisis of some choice that you've been making this wrong, it's time to go to prayer. It's time to spend time with God. It's time to lay this thing on the altar before God. And not just, oh, I've sinned, forgive me. But I think it's time to seek God's face until you know you have discovered his grace in whatever area of your life that might be. But praise God, the Lord Jesus Christ, he did that for us. He went through it. He dealt with it to the point of nearly dying. And somehow after this angel ministers to him in Matthew 25, he turns, he walks out again to the disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping? Behold, the hour is at hand that the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hand of sinners. Get up and let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. Scarcely said the words, and when the assault and the arrest come upon him. Can you imagine, though? Can you imagine just for a moment that Jesus comes out that third time covered in blood? I mean, the disciples, you know, if it were not dark, they probably would have been horrified. And I, I would still think that they probably, what has happened to you? What is going on? What took place? What took place is he went into the hardest place that anyone could ever go, and that's the place of, well, good Bible word is found in 1 John when it says, he is our propitiation. He took my place. He took your place. And everything that we should endure, he endured on our behalf. Everything that we should suffer, he suffered on our behalf. Everything that we should undergo, he underwent for us. And it doesn't just start over here with the bleed, beating by the Romans or the being slapped around by the Sanhedrin or the high priest. It begins over here in the Garden of Gethsemane. Well, it's a beautiful, glorious, but yet same time horrendous as he's there in that upper room telling them everything's getting ready to happen, giving them instruction all the way there, telling them to watch. Then he begins the process of being offered up as the Lamb of God for our sins. Boy, when we think about Gethsemane, we certainly ought to stand back in awe because there's so much more than I can even describe that probably happened in those hours in Gethsemane while Jesus Christ was praying, enduring, watching, beholding as the Holy Lamb of God who knew no sin approaches to embrace the wickedness of humanity that you and I might be made right with God. You know, having knew no sin. Having knew no sin. It's amazing how pure and how righteous. You know, I don't think we understand that. You know, I don't, I don't think we, we, we always get it. But that's the love of God. Would you stand with your heads bowed? There was some more.